Thank you very much. So I'm very excited to present to this awesome conference. And um, I will tell you about interactions in microbial communities and how we can measure these interactions and how these interactions matters for the whole community and the processes it performs. So microbial communities are dense aggregates of cells uh, that typically move little. Within these communities, cells can take up and release metabolites, like amino acids or sugars. And these chemicals mediate interactions between cells. All these interactions together determine the processes that a community can perform. Now, each individual cell typically interacts within a finite range. Therefore, if we want to understand the network of interactions within the community, we need to understand the spatial arrangements of the single cells and the interaction range between them. We were interested in reconstructing the spatial interaction network within a microbial community. And to do so, we engineered a simple microbial community composed of two cell types. These two cell types cannot produce an amino acid each, but they can grow together by receiving this amino acid from the partner. We can also distinguish these two cell types under fluorescent microscopy because the two cell types um, consistently express a fluorescent marker. Now that we have a microbial community, we needed a tool to observe this microbial community for a longer period of time and look at cells, how they arrange and how they grow um, uh, in the cellular context of this community. So to do this, we develop a microfluidic device where we can feed media that we design for longer periods of time and we can grow our communities in some welcoming environments like these chambers. This chamber you see here can host about 1,200 cells that grow as monolayers. And we image these communities as they grow for about four days, taking a snapshot every 10 minutes. So this is how a typical data looks like. This is a time-lapse movie of a microfluidic chamber. As you can see, we have full information of the spatial arrangement of the two cell types. But not only that, we have also the resolution to measure the growth of single cells one by one. So this is a perfect data set to ask, how does a cell uh, interact with its neighbors? A naive expectation would be that a cell surrounded by the partner from which it received the amino acid would grow faster. So the question we ask exactly is, which is the neighborhood that predicts a cell's growth rate? Which is the neighborhood that contributes to a cell's growth rate? To address this question, we develop an analysis pipeline where we would identify single cells and measure their uh, length in time to estimate the growth rate of the single cells. What you see here are growth rates of single cells depicted as a color map. So uh, brighter colors indicate uh, faster growth rates of single cells. As you can see, growth rate of cells close to the interface are higher. And you can also notice that the purple cell grows well also far away from the interface between the two cell types. So how can we use now this rich data set to answer the question, how large is the neighborhood that predicts the cell's growth rate? So we focus on individual cells and we analyze the composition of the neighborhood with a fixed uh, range. So we can plot the growth rate of the cell and the fraction of the partner type, the one from which the cell received the amino acid, the fraction within this fixed neighborhood. If we repeat this for many cells, we obtain a whole scatter plot, which tell us that cells tend to grow faster when they are surrounded by the partner. And we can also calculate a correlation score, a sperm correlation score in this case. Now the question is, did we analyze the right neighborhood? So we can repeat this analysis with a larger neighborhood and we will obtain a new scatter plot with a new correlation score, which is higher in this case. Now, if we iterate this process, 
and we analyze different neighborhood sizes, we obtain a whole curve of Spearman correlations, and we find that there's a maximum of the correlation, which is found at 11 micrometers from the cell membrane. So this is the neighborhood that we have to analyze to best predict a cell's growth rate. This is what we call interaction range. Now, interestingly, when we analyzed the other cell type, we found that it interacts at a much smaller range. If we repeat this analysis on many replicates, we find this very consistently. So the purple cell type interacts at about 11 micrometers, which is about three times its cell length, its body length, while the uh, yellow type interacts at about one cell length. So these interactions are very local. I like to think that these cells really live in a small world. So now the question was, when do cells live in a small world? Or in other words, what are the biochemical parameters that set the interaction range between single cells? To address this question, we constructed a biophysical model of amino acid exchange. So in this model, cells live in space and they exchange amino acids through diffusion in the extracellular environment. At any location in space, we can keep track of the internal and external concentration of the two exchanged amino acids. And the growth rate of each single cell is a function of the limiting amino acid, the one that the cell cannot produce and has to receive from the partner. So the internal and external concentration of amino acids change because cells pick up amino acids from the environment, leak amino acids in the environment where they diffuse. And a small note is that the diffusion uh, also depends on the cellular density within these changes. So we correct for this factor. Now, from these biochemical parameters, what are the ones that really set the interaction range between cells? So the first thing we did to check uh, the validity of our model was to apply literature parameters from the two amino acids that our community is exchanging tryptophan and prolin and see whether applying this model to our real configuration, the real arrangement we measure in the lab, whether we can predict the cell growth rate and the interaction range that we measured experimentally. So what we did is that we took many replicate, many replicates communities, we simplified the arrangements and we calculate a landscape of amino acids using our, our model. And from that, we can estimate the growth rate of cells. Now we use these predicted cell, uh, growth rates to repeat the same analysis that we did on the actual measured growth rate. And what we find is that the model is able to recapitulate the interaction range that we measured, we find experimentally. Now, our model allows us also to generalize beyond our specific microbial community. And in general, it allows us to ask the question, which biophysical parameters set the interaction range? So through analytical calculations, we can show that the interaction range mostly uh, depends on the uptake rates of amino acids. In fact, in fact, we can see that there is a very weak dependence on the liquid rate of the exchange amino acid, while there's a stronger dependence on the uptake rate of these amino acids. So to have an intuition of what's going on, you can think that a molecule that is released by a producer cell doesn't travel very far if uptake rates are very high, which means that the interaction that this molecule mediates, it's a short range interaction. So short, uh, short range interaction um, are due to high uptake, uptake rates of amino acids. Now, within this range set by the uptake rates, cells are sensitive to the local composition of this neighborhood. And the more they find the partner type within this neighborhood, the faster they grow. And we can also predict the fastest growth rate they can achieve uh, using our individual based model. And we find that this growth rate mostly depends 
on the leakage of amino acids. So we find that the interaction range and the maximum growth rate are tuned independently. These results give us a simple way of thinking at the problem. So what we did is that we dropped our computer, not literally, but we took paper and pen, and we decided to uh, create a simple model of these communities where two cell types affect each other's growth. So we can think that each cell interacts within a fixed neighborhood. Now, the more the fraction, uh, the higher the fraction of the partner type within this neighborhood, the faster the focal cell grows. And these two parameters, the interaction range and the maximum growth rate, are tuned independently from two biophysical parameters. We can define these two and we can tune them independently one from another. Now we, we will define these same two quantities for the other cell type and these two quantities might differ from the first uh, cell type. Now we built a simple mathematical framework to treat such a system and uh, with this uh, mathematical framework we were able to make some predictions. And we found out that the maximal growth rate and the interaction range of the two cell types set independently the community composition, the growth of the community, and the cluster, the typical cluster size of the two cell types. I don't have the time to go into the details, but I invite you to go and check out our bioarchive paper if you're really curious. Anyways, I'm gonna spoil a little bit the story and tell you uh, how does, um, you know, these spatial communities, how do they grow compared to a well-mixed community? So we know that the interaction range is a key quantity in those communities. So what happens when we modulate this interaction range and perhaps we make it as large as, you know, the whole system? How does the spatial system grow compared to the well-mixed system? Here I will show you the growth rate of the spatial system compared to well, the well-mixed system. So here, what we did is that we modulated the ratio between the two maximal growth rates and the ratio between the two interaction range of the two cell types. And we found out that the growth rate of the whole system is always lower than the growth rate of the well-mixed equivalent. Moreover, we found some interesting things that certain communities where the, uh, the, inter the interaction range is small and the difference in growth rates is very high, might not exist in, in spatial systems. So some communities might collapse if they have very different growth rates and interact locally. So I invite you to check out our bioarchive paper if you want to read more about this. At the moment, I'm gonna conclude by saying that I believe that this, uh, this complex uh, system that we find in nature, uh, are all dictated by a few key properties that can be studied using simple, the simple systems. And here we use the simple consortia of two cell types that allowed us to scale up properties from the molecular level to the individual level to the community level. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'd like to thank all the people, people that have collaborated with me on these um, this projects and obviously also uh, the funding. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Alma. That's been a great talk. It's been really interesting to see the different scales and the experiments and theory to be integrated into one piece of work. Um, you have one question already. Uh, I'll read it out um, from Maria, I don't know the last name. To what extent is the small neighborhood due to crowdedness? In other words, to what extent are processes density versus frequency dependent? Yeah, so uh, the effect of cellular density is the following. Cellular density reduces the diffusion constant of these amino acids. So the more cells are dense, the slower molecules diffuse in the system. This means that high cellular density typically shorten the interaction range between cells because molecules are slower to run away from the producer 
to say it in really uh, simple terms. Um, so I hope I, I am answered the question. Okay. I have a question myself. So yes. you looked in great detail at the system. Um, and I wondered whether you can learn something about the, the limits of interaction ranges. Like if you consider typical parameter values for other systems or like just a range of parameters, can you, can you learn something about the, the, the interaction range? Or if somebody tells you the interaction range is one meter, you say this can't be for the following reasons. Okay, well, definitely once you have this biophysical model, you can just tune parameters one by one, the leakage rate by itself, the update rate by itself, and you can see what happens to the interaction rate. So that's, uh, given that we have the analytical formula, that's, that's uh, very possible. Now, if you read the details of, of uh, the publication, you see that the story is more complex, that there's a proportionality sign between the formula I show and the interaction range, but let's say you know a lot of the fact of each single parameter. I hope that this is the, question, the, the answer to your question. I'll ask a follow-up question later, but, yeah. uh, but, but let's, uh, let's move on to some other people's questions. Uh, Pram van Dijk wants to know how important the asymmetry between the interaction range between the species is, i.e. how much could they differ in the models without collapsing the system? Ah, okay. So um, uh, this depends. Obviously, there are many parameters you are tuning at the same time. But what we saw uh, is that uh, generally, let's say, the more locally you interact, the least there can be difference between the growth rates. So uh, systems with very high, um, let's say, asymmetry in the growth rate cannot live in a, in a very local, localized uh, world, let's say, while they can in well mixed world. And, uh, uh, and maybe, yeah, if you, if, by looking at the paper, you can, you can really look how we slice this parameter space and where are the zones where the system will collapse. Okay, thank you. Uh, there are a number of other questions which we don't have time to um, get into detail live, but they will be all copied over to the channel of the talk, and I'm looking forward to following the discussion there later. Okay, um, so thank you very much. With and, that, uh, 